Good afternoon. This is Dyke Hendrickson, and I am hosting the podcast Life Along the Merrimack. Each week, we talk about the health and history of the Merrimack River, of the basin that we live in, and also Plum Island. Uh, as we get to the autumn, which we are now, it's mid-September, we get into a storm season. And over the years, um, there have been numerous shipwrecks off of Plum Island. Now, I'm not predicting shipwrecks this fall, but we're going to be talking about some of the remarkable history of maritime Newburyport and also the challenges of um, being a ship owner, being a ship captain, um, and the many shipwrecks that took place off of Plum Island and around the Merrimack River. And of course, this is 96.3 Joppa Radio and local Channel 9 television. Shipwrecks were um, a very prevalent de development in the 18th and 19th centuries in this country as elsewhere. And one reason is that was before the age of motorized vessels. You counted on the, the wind and the tides and uh, the um, different currents in the ocean. And having shipwrecks, unfortunately, was a major uh, element of the North Shore of Massachusetts. In fact, in 1786, the Massachusetts Humane Society was created just so they can try to respond to shipwrecks, not only off of Plum Island, of course, Salisbury, Ipswich, you know, Portland, Maine, Boston, everywhere. It was just becoming very prevalent. Uh, people were dying and many, uh, much cargo was lost. So in 1786, the uh, Massachusetts Humane Society was created. And in 1806, the society actually put a few huts on Plum Island. And so the theory was that if a shipwreck, no one was around and the sailors could get to the island somehow, these were small huts, they had firewood, they had matches, they had a little um, food and a little water that could get people going. But it was a very prevalent thing and really literally hundreds of shipwrecks took place in the past two centuries. One, what we're looking at now, and I recognize some people are listening and some people are watching, but we're looking at a photo from 1892 off of Plum Island. It's a photo of a three master under duress. Uh, the, the waves are high and in the foreground, there's about a lifeboat or a ship with lifesavers in it is going out to the vessel. Now there are the six men in the rowboat. Uh, they're pulling hard, the waves are high. And you know, for a photo taken in 1892, this is a brilliant image. And I say that because photography was supposedly created in about eight, 1839. Newburyport was one of the first areas to have photographers. Some historians say we were the first. I'm not going with that necessarily, but we were among the first communities to have photography in about 1839. This is from 1892 and it shows a vessel. Um, the sails are down, the, um, the, the ship, the small vessel with six uh, lifesavers is just going out to it. And it's very dramatic. And again, I say this is a wonderful photo. You can actually see gulls in the air. It's almost like Steven Spielberg set it up for a still. Um, but I've asked people about this and this was a photo and it shows the challenges of being in a shipwreck off of Plum Island. And one reason for this is because the, the bay off of uh, the river, the Merrimack River is, is a half a moon. And so if you get caught in this kind of moon, it's very hard to come about and sail into the wind if the wind is coming from the east. Now, um, it, at most, most times, um, the pe people would turn around and they'd be buffeted, say from a nor'easter. The wind would be coming at them. They tried to come about, they try to sail out of it, but frequently, because of this half moon configuration, 
they were caught. And it looks like that's what this happened here. Here is a photo of a different photo, but it shows a stalwart group of about five in a boat going out to save a stricken vessel. There's four rowing and there's a, a sternman who's got the um, a large oar uh, or a rudder to keep the vessel on course. And there were many volunteers who would go down to Plum Island and other places. Later, of course, it became a paid service. And this is an example of, you know, it was a tough situation of you get the call, you have to get ready. And um, this <laughs> looks like winter because those fellows have on peacoats and it couldn't have been fun, but they were dedicated and hardy people trying to save lives. This is an intriguing photo. What we're looking at is several men have what looked like uh, cannons out there. Uh, it's called Gun Practice Plum Island Newburyport. But what this is, in the old days, um, they had these guns which would send a, a large hook on a rope out to a vessel. So in the foreground of the ocean, we see a vessel and they are shooting uh, this a uh, very large hook, as it were, out to the vessel. There's a rope attached to it. And if they hit the vessel or um, some one of the crew members can get a hold of uh, this, the anchor type thing of the hook, then they can either be dragged to shore or in some larger vessels, they can actually put it in the, in the high sails and shimmy down it and get it back to shore. Now it does seem we like it's the early stage of, of this technology because to think that a cannon like substance sending a hook, you know, for perhaps 50 or 100 yards towards the ocean, hitting the vessel, not knocking someone's head off, and having them actually attach the hook and the line to the vessel, it seems like the percentage would be on the low side. I have never seen percentages. But this is an intriguing photo. And again, uh, several um, of the lifesavers are doing this. They've taken their cannons down to shore. They're practicing. In the lower right, you see a little boy. <laughs> it's probably the son of one of the people. And this was one of the ways that they tried to save people. They'd send a hook with a rope attached to it. And the plan was to get the people, either tow them in with the group on the shore or with larger cases where you had higher masts, some people would try to shimmy down or be driven down. And um, it was certainly an earnest effort to deal with ships that were uh, couldn't go either way. They couldn't get back out to sea, they couldn't get any closer. And yet, particularly in the winter, um, you were trying to save lives. Here is a photo um, from the early 19th early 20th century of a life-saving crew on Plum Island. And here there are about five or six fellows in front of the US life-saving station on Plum Island. And they've got nice natty uniforms and good, got good hats. And they also have this co a vessel that they can just push down to the water and head out to sea to save um, a floundering um, or a foundering vessel. And I think you can see the tracks there that also help the movement of <clears throat> the wheels to get down to the water. Now, it should be said that we know of the Coast Guard today, which has a very strong presence in Newburyport. And as some of you know, Newburyport is the birthplace of the Coast Guard. Um, in 1790, President Washington signed a writ to create 10 revenue cutters and they were built, and the first one of these 10 was built in Newburyport. It was called the Massachusetts. And so forever, Newburyport is the birthplace of the Coast Guard. And there are people who argue that Salem and Boston, Annapolis, um, but in fact, President Lyndon Johnson in 1965 signed a proclamation saying that Newburyport was the birthplace of the Coast Guard. Now, I don't know what politicking had to take place that day, 1965. He probably had a lot on his mind. 
He had a voting rights bill. He had Vietnam starting, but somehow he had the wherewithal to sign this proclamation, making Newburyport the birthplace of the Coast Guard. So I mention that because um, these folks are early members of the Coast Guard, um, but such a name did not exist until 1915. Now, at that time, they had the Revenue Cutter Service, um, as we've talked about, those were the ships that stopped smuggling and collected bounties. And there was a US Life Saving Service, as you see here. Those two organizations were merged in 1915. And in 1939, uh, those two merged with the Lighthouse Service. So 1915, we got the word Coast Guard in our lexicon. In 1939, the Lighthouse Service was created. And so now we have a very robust Coast Guard now, for a while, the Coast Guard was with the Transportation Department. Now it is in the Department of Homeland Security. Following the um, attacks of 9-11, which we've seen quite a bit about lately, um, the Coast Guard took on a much more military role. Of course, it is a military service. Coasties have been active in every war, including Vietnam, where they had a very large um, piece and activity because there were a lot of rivers. There was a lot of coastline in Vietnam. So the Coast Guard has always been part of that. But after 9-11, uh, the Coast Guard has taken on a much greater role in terms of security, uh, checking vessels, uh, looking for perhaps bombs, for ha perhaps terrorists. And this is in Boston, New York, um, the major cities. It also does inspections. It'll board vessels, even small vessels, in the harbor here in Newburyport. They're looking for bad people or bad substances. Um, so the Coast Guard has certainly taken on a larger role in the last two decades. And should you be wondering, there are about 92,000 members of the Coast Guard. Some are active, that's about 32,000. Some are in the reserve, that's about 35,000. And there is reserve here in Newburyport. Some are uh, auxiliary, and um, that, in fact, the auxiliary has a 35,000. Reserves nationally have about 10,000, and there are about 7,000 uh, civilian workers. So there are many, many miles of the coast here in the United States. In New England alone, if you count the inlets and the harbors and whatever, there are thousands of miles of coast. And the Coast Guard also is very active in mid-America, on the Great Lakes, they have numerous Coast Guard stations on the Mississippi River. I've been to two of them in Memphis, and uh, I used to live in New Orleans, and so I know that um, they also have the Coast Guard there. So from the early incidents, as we saw, starting in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, before there were motors, uh, there was much life-saving to be done uh, before uh, that became motorized vehicles, of course, vessels. And of course, there's still a lot to be done. But this early photo shows what the life-saving station looked like on Plum Island. Now, here is an example of real life. We are looking at a photo of the bounty. The bounty in about 2012 um, sank off of North Carolina. Of course, this made a great deal of attention. Um, there were many inquiries, but uh, this is an example of what should not be happening. And the Coast Guard was called at a very late hour. Um, the actual bounty was built, the vessel was built in 1960 for the movie Mutiny on the Bounty with Marlon Brando and others. And it stayed, it was kind of a museum at different places along New England for about, you know, decades. In fact, it was in New Bedford, Massachusetts for quite a while. But towards the turn of the century, in about 2010 or so, um, it was leased out to a group in Florida, so it could be a museum and a tourist attraction. So in 2012, in October, uh, 
The vessel was taken to Booth Bay Harbor, Maine to be refitted and to get ready for its sail down to um, Florida. Now, it came down the coast of New England. In fact, it stayed in Newburyport for a night or two. And it should be noted that even though it was a, a three-master, about 250 to 300 feet long, and had a crew of 16, uh, it was old-fashioned in the sense that it had sails, but it was a modern vessel. It had an engine it, so it could get out of trouble. It had very good technology. It um, internet, it had weather service reports. And so um, the captain and others knew that uh, the hurricane was going to be coming along. And it was Superstorm Sandy at the time, but it turned out to be um, Hurricane Sandy. That still seems to be, I see it different in different places. Maybe it depends upon the time. It started out as a superstorm. It was certainly a very dangerous hurricane. So they were off the coast of North Carolina, about 50 miles, and they started um, taking on water. Now, the review of this and the Coast Guard had a significant uh, hearing about this, uh, indicated that the captain, Robin Walbridge, who lost his life, his body was never found, um, was very slow to call the Coast Guard. And, you know, finally a couple of the officers came up and said, look, we're in trouble, we're taking on water, we can't get rid of it, the pumps aren't working well, we've got to call the Coast Guard. It was only then that he did call the Coast Guard. That was, I'm thinking on a Wednesday afternoon, like three to five in the afternoon. So the Coast Guard sent some planes off in the basin, coastal North Carolina, and they spotted the vessel. So it would be very hard for a chopper to get out there and find a vessel because choppers don't, can't stay in the air that long. But they saw the bounty, they saw it was under duress, they got its course, they got into radio contact, so the communication was good. But it was too late for them to send out a chopper. The following morning, uh, choppers went out from the coastal North Carolina. And this is what they saw. Um, they, the, the ship was underwater. And if you're watching on local cable nine, you can see right exactly in the middle of this frame uh, is an orange spot. And it could be a person, it could be the captain. He was the last one to leave the ship. And of course, he never actually left the ship. 14 of the 16 people uh, were saved by the Coast Guard. Captain Walbridge was lost, and so was um, a, another um, a sailor, a Can Claudine Christian, her name was. She was 42 from California. They did recover her body. They did rush her to a hospital on the coast. She did not survive. She was supposedly a distant relative of Fletcher Christian from Mutiny on the Bounty fame of two or three centuries earlier. And so that added to the interest in the story. I mean, not that a vessel going, a tall ship going down doesn't have news value. And I only say this as a career news guy. I was in the newspapers for about four decades. So I can say these things about value of news. But they did get 14 of 16 back to land and they lived. One fortunate element of that was they had two lifeboats and both lifeboats had covers on them. So they put about 12 to 13, no, 11 or 12 people got into the two lifeboats and the, the covers helped because they didn't have to bail so much. You know, they are somewhat um, held back away from the wind, but they didn't take in as much water either. So there were one or two, I think one person was floating on in a life survivor suit. So you had, let's see, 13 in the lifeboats and one person floating free. The choppers got there after dawn the next morning, one chopper at a time. And I interviewed uh, one of the women who uh, had been a co-pilot of a chopper. And I said, wow, what was it like to <clears throat> get a call at five in the morning and say, you're going out, this is not a drill. So she was really good 
um, in order, I wrote a book about the New England Coast Guard. And so that's why I was doing these interviews. But she said, you know, we're trained for this. And at five in the morning, the first thing we did is go on the internet and we looked up what the ship looked like and um, what its capabilities were. Because, and she said that the biggest question we had um, <laughs> at 5.15 a.m. was what is it doing out there? This storm has been touted for two days. Every commercial vessel is in, in you know, it went to dock. All the pleasure vessels are also at their moorings or in slips. What were they doing out there? And I suppose the answer to that is the captain wanted to get to Florida on time to have a business meeting. Now, of course, this is not really a great answer when you lost two people, including your own life, but that's what came out in the Coast Guard hearings. He wanted to get there. The other thing, which seems like a bad idea to me, uh, he wanted to go east to get around the storm. He felt that if he went west and got into a harbor somewhere, he you know there'd be a lot of waves and turmoil, and the vessel would bump up against the dock and maybe damage the vessel. So the bad thinking there, as I look back on it, as others have, is this was a very large storm. And the weather departments, you know, the, the computer printouts that they got showed that it went for many miles, hundreds of miles in both directions, but particularly east. So he thought, well, we can get out of the way of the storm and we can, you know, take a different course to Florida. This is a very bad idea. And the Coast Guard reviewers later said, you know, he, he had the information. He couldn't outrun the storm. He couldn't get farther away. And so this was what we call pilot error, but it certainly was a deadly error. I'm Dyke Hendrickson. This is Life Along the Merrimack. We're at 96.3 Joppa Radio and local channel nine on cable. And so this was uh, the end of the bounty. Um, 12, uh, 14 of 16 were saved, two died. And uh, that will be remembered for a long time. It's one of the worst um, disasters in modern times, particularly you know, in reviewing these things and knowing they had the weather reports. Um, it just seems like he waited too long to tell the Coast Guard he was in trouble. And he had a basic error by trying to go east to outrun the storm rather than west where he could have gone into port. This is a little, a modern photo of what a rescue would look like. This is a 47 foot Coast Guard vessel. It's in high seas off of the North Shore. And everybody is, you know, tucked in there. They've got their seat belts on, they're holding on. And if you're listening to this, it's a very dynamic Coast Guard photo showing this vessel in high seas. And um, it certainly looks like being in the Coast Guard can have some exciting and tumultuous moments. So I got a call several years ago and you know, a fellow wanted me to sign his book. And I said, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, what's, what's the reason? And he said, well, you know, this, book, this picture of the 47 footer was on the cover of your book about the Coast Guard. And I was at the helm that day. I was the captain of the ship. It was, a, and I said, well, congratulations. You, you kept the ship, you got it back. And he said, yeah, it was a wild day. These things happen. And so one of the things that intrigues me about a 47 footer is that they turn over um, and sometimes they do, they actually are designed to come back up, right side up and the engine is still running. So this was my big chance. I said, well, I know you didn't go over that day, but is this true about a 47 footer? If it goes over, will it come up on, you know, top side up and still running? And he said, it can, because I you know some people on the West Coast, they were doing drills, they went over, the vessel came up, right side up, it was still running. So these things are, you know, built for tough seas and on the North Shore of Massachusetts, off of Merrimack River and off of Plum Island. Um, there's some rough seas from time to time. Here is a photo looking at the modern Coast Guard. If you're listening, that is the ship Eagle. It's a tall ship. 
uh, about 300 feet long, three masts. And um, it was actually built in Germany in the 30s. And America got it as a war prize in 1946. And so they fitted it out as a tall ship. And it's used nowadays to teach cadets at the US Coast Guard Academy how to, you know, how to navigate by the wind, by the stars, and you know, how to keep a ship of sail underway. But this is a real Coast Guard uh, asset. And um, to your right, uh, to your left rather, there's a chopper. Choppers were only developed in the early 40s. They were developed in Connecticut by Iger Sikorsky. But choppers are very valuable to the Coast Guard today. And as you just listened to, uh, the choppers were essential in rescuing those people off, off of North Carolina. Here is a photo that is more in tune with what the Coast Guard does today. It shows um, a 41 footer coming up to a sailboat that is disabled. Um, they may have lost its motor or dropped a rudder, whatever. The, the Coast Guard will make contact, will go to the vessel if the people want them to come, maybe take someone up, off board who is sick or just, you know, give him an extra part or give him some advice. But the Coasties don't really do too much towing of vessels as they once did. As we mentioned, um, the Coast Guard does a lot more security now and helping a pleasure boat is not a priority. You know, looking for terrorists or looking for drugs or um, trying to, you know, save vessels that are going under, that is what they're after now. So again, the Newburyport is the birthplace of the Coast Guard and here's a Coast Guard vessel at work. This is a wonderful shot by a fellow named Tim Campbell. He was in a, in a, I think he has a drone. And, but look at, you can just see how um, this is the coastline of Newburyport of Plum Island and the waves are very significant. And you can see if you were in a vessel uh, without power again, as they were until about the 20th century along this coast at, at least, um, you could be in some big trouble. But this is a gorgeous photo. It shows most of Plum Island all the way going down. It shows the river, but it also shows, shows the ferocity of the surf and the waves. So therefore, I think we all have to be careful, you know, on windy days, on stormy days. There are 1,500 vessels um, registered in the Merrimack River just on the Newburyport side this summer. So there are a lot of vessels out there if you're part of the sailing crew, you know, remember this photo because this is a tumultuous ocean right off of Plum Island. Here's a photo I love. It's not exactly a shipwreck. Actually, it's a family from, you know, late uh, 19th century. They're on Plum Island, they're having a nice time. Um, they have umbrellas, they have, the women have hats and long dresses, the men, <laughs> the men have hats, jackets and ties. It's a little more formal back then, but I just love this photo as if to say, well, geez, if you get on Plum Island and you're not in a vessel and you're not in a storm uh, and, you know, just at the turn of the 20th century, this is the way people enjoyed the day. And you can see at the turn of the century, um, there were cat cottages and tourists, and but this was not built up like it is today. And so, we all know that Plum Island has many houses and thousands of tourists each summer and actually thousands of people year round. But here's a photo I like to look at it, a century, maybe almost 1890, I'm thinking, where a family was out having a nice day on Plum Island, fully dressed, even with umbrellas. And I would think that's for the sun, <laughs> not for the rain, but they are having a good time. So this is Life Along the Merrimack. It's a weekly podcast. We talk about the health and history of the Merrimack River. Lately, I have expanded that to consider also Plum Island because I'm writing a book titled Plum Island, A Vulnerable Gem. I'm working on that now. It's very exciting. And <laughs> that's why I have a few pictures from Plum Island. But we're at 96.3 Joppa Radio, local channel nine on cable TV. And again, Dyke Hendrickson, 
life along the Merrimack. Uh, we talk about the health and history of the Merrimack River, and we will back. We will be back to talk with you another time. Thank you for being here.